welcome everyone to day 10 on our 30 day cleanse program, our cleanse challenge. Um, I just want to kind of get a feel for how everything is going so far. How are you feeling, Selena? Um, I'm starting to feel better the first week. Um, I just felt bloated like the entire time. Mm -hmm. um, but I've noticed since yesterday that's starting to kind of go away a little bit. Good. Awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a question for you. Yes. Is it possible to be allergic to the product? So are you allergic to any ingredient? Have you noticed? So, I mean, I have like a intolerance to like dairy and gluten. I mean, I still eat it in my diet. Sometimes it like triggers my allergies. Other times it's fine. Mm -hmm. But I found um, sometimes when I take like this stuff, like right away my allergies kind of start up. So I'm wondering if there's like a connection there. So there's no gluten or dairy in the products. Okay. So it shouldn't be triggering an allergic reaction, but you probably okay. are just kind of releasing some toxins and stuff. And that's probably why. And also it is a really bad allergy season this year. So. It, yeah, no, it is. So I wasn't sure if there was like a correlation between it, the products or it just was like the like general kind of allergies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's hard to tell really, but um, I'll just let you know that even for myself, like this year has been a really bad allergy season for myself. Okay. Normally I'm, I'm like good, but this yeah. year it's been pretty tough for me. Okay. okay, let's move on then. All right, so um, today we're going to be covering what is a prebiotic fiber, um, what is microbiome diversity and why do we care, and why should we be focusing on enhancing our nutrition through this process, right, and why we want to prioritize protein specifically. Um, so again, with our this whole cleanse and uh, cleanse process, um, here are our goals for the next 30 days. We want to be able to monitor our bodies for changing changes in these areas, right? Our physical health, our mental health. And we. this is basically going to help us decide what lifestyle changes we want to start, right? If we want to start, um, you know, increasing physical activity or if we're motivated to make better food choices, which usually happens when we are, are dealing with some reduced cravings. Um, I don't know if you've experienced that so far, but I know that for myself, I remember when I went through the cleanse for the first time, I noticed that within like a week or so, I noticed I wasn't gravitating towards certain foods that I used to be gravitating towards. And so here's a little recap of where we started and what this cleanse is doing for us. So before our digestive grass, um, as an analogy, was pretty much unkept and exposed to a toxic environment. Um, by the foods that we were eating, by the poor nutrition we were giving it, and the intestinal damage from like prescription medication, like antibiotics or pollution from our environment, bad bugs, bacteria, it needed work, right? Um, yeah. and so that's what we're doing with this cleanse process. We are adding what's missing in our diet and um, adding what's missing from our gut microbiome. And so these prebiotic fibers in the live fiber specifically help us give us a clean slate. We're feeding the healthy bacteria, removing this old grass and helping us grow new grass or these new species of bacteria. And now we're really gonna start to work on improving our nutrition by boosting our protein intake and lowering our sugar intake. Did you have a question? Nope, good. Okay, perfect. I'm just gonna mute you just in case we get any feedback, okay? Yep. Great. And so now current research is showing that our microbiome can change within three to four days of dietary intervention. So that's probably, probably you notice some of the bloating and gassiness and that's because our gut microbiome is changing. So it's in our best interest to learn about, you know, certain foods and, and you know, products that can help us Im impact and improve our microbiome and its diversity. And so even though we can start to notice these changes within a week, achieving a healthy microbiome is still a long process, right? It can, it's a pretty much long-term commitment and can take up to six, to six months for us to notice any significant changes and improvements, right? That doesn't mean that you do have to do this cleanse for the next like six months. It just means that you, you have to, uh, you know, just be committed to the process, notice, uh, the long-term effects of this cleanse after the 30 days, right? And work to um, incorporate certain foods and nutritional principles that can help you see these long-term improvements moving forward, right? So again, we're not doing this cleanse for six months. We're doing this for just 30 days, but this 
process for achieving a healthy microbiome can take up to six months for some people, depending on how serious or severe their symptoms are. So here's where we're at. We're right in the middle where we are starting to strip, starting to strip out that old grass, those leaves, bad bugs, organisms, and Basically, what we're doing is we're starting to plant the seeds for new, healthy, and diverse forms of bacteria to grow. So now soon after this cleanse process, we'll have a nice patch of green grass with healthy function, and that's the goal. That's something we can definitely look forward to. But in order for us to do that, we have to continue to use our prebiotic fiber, that live fiber, and learn how we can improve our nutrition by increasing our protein intake and lowering our sugar intake. So in my last cleanse program, I had a Dr. Lucas Grant, who's an expert on the microbiome, and he did his whole PhD on microbiome and nutrients that affect the microbiome. And he gave a lot of his insight on the importance of the microbiome and what microbiome diversity is. And this is what we're gonna be talking about in this webinar. One of the biggest takeaways to understand from this session was that a healthy microbiome is like a healthy, diverse community. You know, we have important roles in communities, and when there's imbalances, there are problems. You know, we have police officers, we have firefighters, we have, you know, doctors, we have lawyers, we have accountants, we have all of these important roles. You know, we have, you know, sanitary workers, we have, um, you know, people that work in our communities to make sure our parks are clean. And, you know, if we don't have, you know, certain um, members in our community and these start these members start to break down and they start to you know start to not work anymore we start to notice a failure of uh, these these members to do what they were supposed to do because they're not present anymore and so it can create backups right so this is what happens when a healthy diverse community fails right we start to lose these specific groups of important bacteria in our gut and we start to notice inflammation and problems associated with that so for example like a garbage strike right we've all experienced that we know what happens when there's a garbage strike uh, a breakdown of the community occurs no one is taking out the garbage anymore it's not getting cleared out um, and the same thing can happen in our bodies. When we're missing important bacteria, our gut is not going to function in a healthy way. There's going to be pileups, and that's going to cause pro-inflammatory uh, pro responses in our bodies. And we call this dysbiosis, right? And some of the causes of these, this dysbiosis is from, you know, having too much processed food in our diet or having imbalances in our diet or having periods of, of um, you know, in our diet where we're not the healthiest and not the cleanest and that can affect in our our inside function you know prescription medication um over the counter or, or non-prescription medication as well right that can also impact our gut microbiome antibiotics are also a big factor especially uh, because a lot of antibiotics are broad spectrum of antibiotics so they don't have a specific targeted location they can disrupt a lot of the good species of bacteria that are in our systems and i went through that personally right when i when i talked to you guys about my first experience and why I wanted to do the cleanse, it was because I went on two courses of antibiotics and I noticed an immediate change, an immediate shift in my body's uh, ability to digest foods. I started to bloat immediately. Um, and I can confidently say like even a month after now the, doing the cleanse, I am so, like I don't deal with any bloating anymore. Um, it's, it was a process, but it was something that I was able to achieve and I feel really good now. I feel my function is a lot more smoother. And so another interesting factor is that the gut bacteria of people in more developed nations, like where we live, right, in our part of the world, North America, we actually have less diverse microbiomes than those in developing nations. And the reason for that is because if you look at our environment, right, we have a lot more, um, you know, industrial buildings here. We, we get our food from grocery stores. We are, we're not so reliant on like these farmer markets. We, we, aren't, we are very developed and we have a lot of things just, you know, easy access to us, right? We're not spending a lot of time outdoors. And so, our microbacteria or micro microbial diversity is affected because of that, right? The way that we, that our environment is. And so um, our microbiome actually gets established by our environment and our lifestyle choices. So while there's certain aspects of our life that we can't really necessarily control, 
Um, we're not all going to move to India anytime soon, but if we were to uh, focus on what we can control, it's our lifestyle choices. And so if you look at the timeline or time span of, of a baby to an adult, right, an unborn child actually has zero microbes right? They, they, start, they begin to develop and pick up their microbes of uh, their surroundings of their mother, right? Through the vaginal canal and through being breastfed or formula fed, or, you know, when, when they start to eat solid food, you know, their microbial diversity changes as well, right? So it's all about those different lifestyle factors that can affect which species of good bacteria are in your systems and which species of bad bacteria in your systems. And over time, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, a, a healthy individual, most people at some point in their life go through at least one course of some antibiotic treatment. And that can really make a, a big impact in our microbial diversity. Now, antibiotics are great. I'm not going to bash antibiotics and say, no, we don't need them. We definitely do need them. They, they help us clear infections. They literally keep us alive. They're one of the most amazing modern day inventions. But we have to be careful with them and we have to be careful with our overuse of antibiotics because it can lead to um, you know, lifestyle diseases, right? We can see that those that have gone through antibiotics, uh, sorry, uh, you actually see it right here, people that have gone through a lot of courses of antibiotics, which many people have, um, you can see that parallel with the obesity trends, right? There's a very specific overlap between antibiotic use and obesity trends in the U.S. You can see that, you know, and, and, and as Canadians, we're not that much far off, right? Our food quality is better, but we're still not in the best position because in, obesity in Canada is also a growing problem. And I, I skipped over this slide, but I want to kind of come back to it. But if you look at it, antibiotics are found in everything like in our non-organic meats in our milk in our eggs and it adds up to kill the diversity of microbiome over the years so you could be eating a relatively healthy diet but we don't know how much of these antibiotics have gotten into our water we don't know how much of these antibiotics you know have gotten into our foods and even trace amounts of the in our, in our water can add up and if we're overusing antiseptics and sanitizers um, and even the rise of C-sections, for example, can also disrupt that microbial diversity in us, right? On us and within us. And there's been powerful studies on the microbiome in relation to weight loss. You know, I talked about the study last time, but I wanted to re-emphasize it again because this really showed that um, when these microbiomes were switched in these twins, one that was lean and one that was obese, when they were switched, these, that fecal matter was switched and that bacterial species got to populate and, and grow in, in the other twin, they found that there are certain species of bacteria that would help people maintain a healthy weight while um, other species of bacteria would prevent that weight loss and really wreak havoc on the metabolism. And so again, it's important to remember that this cleanse is a reset. And while we reset our gut microbiome, we still have to be mindful of what we're feeding our microbiome, right? Because even though we're giving our body a clean slate, we don't want to set it up with that environment to go back to where it was, right? We want to improve. We want to be the city of progression moving forward. And so we need to understand what we can do to affect our microbiome diversity. So before modernization, our microbes were filled with uh, microbiomes were filled with uh, diverse species of bacteria. We didn't have to worry too much about supplementation because we were getting enough sunlight, we were in a natural environment, being exposed to soils and beneficial organisms naturally, right? So we didn't need these pre prebiotics or probiotics. We didn't need to supplement with fibers because we were getting it from our foods and soils naturally. But the problem is, as I mentioned before, we're living in an urban environment, right? We don't get enough sunlight we're not exposed to this natural, um, you know, grasses and, and, and trees and nature. We live in a very concrete jungle experience. So we don't get exposed to this diverse species of bacteria through our foods anymore. Our agriculture methods have changed. Our, the way we get our food has changed. You know, we go to a grocery store now to get, get our foods and they're perfect, perfect and they're clean. And, you know, we don't even contact that soil, right? And again, the way our food has grown, that's also affected the types of microbes that are found found on our food. And so we're living in a world where our food is 
ultra processed. You know, we have preservatives that unfortunately have that antimicrobial effect, right? These preservatives are meant to help increase the shelf life of our foods. And, um, but it's, it's kind of giving us that opposite effect. While something that can last long in the shelf, it's still not as powerful or impactful in a positive way for our microbes, right? So when we have all this pollution and chemicals in our environments, that's also impacting our microbiome diversity. And while we can't always avoid these harmful pesticides, herbicides, and contaminants, we can't live in a bubble because that's not the point, right? We're trying to get our bodies out there. We want to, and we can't completely cut out these processed foods. I mean, I for myself enjoy and indulge in a good pizza from time to time, you know, and, and, but we can add what's missing in our diet to help bridge the gaps in our nutrition, right? That's the point. It's to make something sustainable, make something a lifestyle, and we can use these tools to help us maintain our digestive lining for our grass. And so this is why food alone isn't enough. Right, we're dealing with challenges with our food food supply, food quality, and agriculture methods. I really emphasize that because if you look at that picture at the top right corner, um, you can see that bananas before were way more fibrous, had less sugar in them, whereas bananas today, um, they're way more sugar and less fiber. And it's not just bananas; this is just one example. But our, all of our fruits and all of our vegetables have changed. They they they've been modified to feed the masses, to be more appealing. The bigger, the better. The more water that's in it, the more mouths it can feed and the more money these food companies can make, right? So if we, if we, so there is a constant need to have a consistent uh, source of diverse prebiotic fibers in our diet because it's lacking in our food now today. And so we are gonna be making, uh, the whole goal of this journey is to really be uh, taking a targeted approach, right? Versus a shotgun approach and just trying all and everything at once. We have, we're going to go through this with a very targeted approach, right? That's why we have that nutrition guide to give you that guidance to help you choose the right foods that are going to help you enhance that microbial diversity, but at the same time, keep your metabolism healthy, right? So we're going to be taking back the control and enhance our micro microbiome diversity by first making sure that we're continuing to add those prebiotic fibers. So continue on to, to take live fiber every morning or after, with, the, with your first meal. That's super, super, super important. Secondly, we're going to talk about how to prioritize protein, which we're going to do this in the next like 10 to 15 minutes or so. We're going to talk about protein, but we're also going to be talking about adding probiotics. And these probiotics are the actual bacteria itself. Prebiotics are fibers that our bacteria feed on. And so we're gonna be talking about probiotics in the next webinar when we do start to incorporate those healthy probiotics into our diet. So why is fiber so important? It's really important to have fiber because the fiber produces um, short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids are beneficial for our metabolism. They absorb nutrients, they help us get energy. You know, 70% of our energy comes from our gut. So we need to make sure that we prioritize the health of these bacteria by feeding them their foods, right? The foods that feed them. And these bacteria function to, for example, strengthen the bowel wall, improve the body's ability to absorb essential nutrients, you know, such as calcium, for example. They produce hormones that actually control appetite and also even um, anxiety and so much more. So if we don't feed these bacteria, the problem is, is that they're going to start to eat up the gut lining, which can lead to reduction in healthy bacterial species and increase the risk of these gut problems in the future. For example, like leaky gut, IBS, diverticulitis, Crohn's, colitis. So we want to make sure that we're giving our bodies these good, healthy prebiotic fibers so that we're not going backwards. We're all trying to move forward and build a healthy, clean microbiome. And so if you look at um, our modern diets, they've changed significantly. This is an average uh, chart showing how much our diets have changed since the 1940s. And as much as us, of us would like to argue that we have a healthy diet, the reality is that numbers don't lie. On average, we are eating less vegetables and less variety of vegetables as years progress. Like cucumber and lettuce and tomato is not considered vegetables. Like that is not enough diversity for our diets. And so we need to think about ways that we can make sure that we enhance that diversity, either through supplementation or increasing the variety of vegetables that we're taking in our diet. 
And the reality is, is our total daily fiber intake is drastically reduced. Um, if you look at the light gray bars in this chart um, from the Journal of Nutrition, we, you can see that the, the light gray bars show that our, those, that's where our recommended intake should be, whereas the dark gray bars are actually representing our, our actual intake. And it doesn't matter what age group you're in, whether you're male or you're female, our total intake has gone down completely. So there's no wonder that the majority of us have been experiencing so many digestive issues, right? It's become such a common thing. And, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people have been reaching out to me about, you know, understanding and, and doing this full cleanse because they, they all deal with these digestive problems. And but one thing we have to understand with when it comes to fiber is that not all fiber is considered a prebiotic fiber. If you look at what fiber is comprised of, there's actually two types of fiber. There's insoluble fiber, which does not dissolve in water and is not fermented by gut bacteria. So what this does, it just provides bulk for a system. So it helps kind of push things along and moves things through. Whereas soluble fiber, the fibers that you can find in live fiber, it does dissolve in water and, and can go on to get fermented by, the, by our gut microbiome, um, um, our gut microbial, uh, microbial, you know, bacterias, they can go on and they can ferment this fiber. And so that's why you started to notice that bloating feeling. And this is because that gut bacteria is starting to ferment these fibers and create those um, short chain fatty acids. So again, like I said, not all fiber is prebiotic. So in, 19, in the mid-1990s, these researchers um, and nutritionists started to become, started to discover something really interesting about soluble fibers, some soluble fibers. So certain soluble fibers, such as like inulin, oligofructose, and fructooligosaccharides, they actually had some really good positive effects in the microbiome, in the, in the bacterial um, colonies in the gut. And so a lot of these, um, soluble fibers are found in live fiber and other unicity fiber products. So I actually take another unicity fiber product, which we'll talk about towards like the end of the cleanse. I don't think it's something necessary to talk about right now, but that also has a lot of these prebiotic fibers, um, these soluble fibers that have that prebiotic effect to help feed and enhance that microbial diversity, which is something that you can continue to do so long after this cleanse is over. And so again, if you look at the recommended intake of what, uh, how much fiber we should be having, we should be having about 30 to 38 grams of fiber per day. That's what's recommended by the government of Canada. And in order for us to get 38 grams of fiber consistently, we need to supplement. This is because if you wanted to get that much fiber, your calorie intake would skyrocket significantly, right? We want to not compromise our total calorie intake. We don't want to gain weight with through by increasing more fiber. We want to eat, eat more variety of foods, but it's hard to do that to get enough varieties of fiber. And so if you look at what the average healthy person gets, they get about eight to 15 grams of fiber a day, which is not close to, to maybe half. And like, you know, a lot of actually of us, when we first do a cleanse, we notice that our body starts to change, right? And that's because your body starts to go through a, an adjustment period, right? It might just be used to a very low fiber diet. So bloating, stomach cramping, gas, fatigue, moodiness, cravings, and headaches, this is all completely normal to feel in your first week. This is a good sign. And so it just is showing that your body has to just readjust the higher fiber intake. And as long as we're patient and we commit to the process, it will all go smoothly and it will start to go away. And so let's just talk about protein, okay? Now, why is protein something that we want to start to incorporate in our diets? Number one, protein is basically the building block for life. It is made up, it makes up everything in our bodies, our hair, our skin, our nails, everything. So, and protein is made up of individual amino acids, right? Which are these building blocks. And we want to think of these amino acids as Lego pieces. And so out of, to make a protein, you need 20 amino acids, nine of which are essential. And essential means that your body just does not make it and you must get it from your diet. And the, the reality is, is that when we look at our diets, we are actually driven innately to eat enough protein. And so this protein leverage hypothesis came out a few years back, and it really talks about how 
human beings will prioritize the, the consumption of food um, and protein in food over every other dietary component and will eat until protein needs have been met regardless of energy content. So that what, what that really means is that, okay, if all we had access to was bread and bread is very low in protein, we need to be able to get, let's say 50 grams of protein a day. We will keep eating and eating and eating that bread until we meet our 50 grams of protein, regardless of how much extra calories we're consuming, regardless of how much extra carbohydrates we're consuming from the, that bread. And so the point is, is that we want to be prioritizing protein over um, when we're choosing foods, because that's going to help us prevent the overconsumption of these other food energy, uh, food substances that are high in energy and low in protein. And so, you know, as a woman, like I know we shy away from protein because we fear it's going to make us like bulky and we're going to get like massive, like insane muscles and stuff like that. And that just, I have to really, really emphasize this does not happen. So if you want to just do like a little quick exercise with me, all you have to do is just hold out your hand and make a fist. Okay. If you measure the, uh, the, your fist to your elbow, that, and, and make a big circle around that, that is about how much space five pounds of fat takes up, okay? And if you were to compare that to just your fist, your fist is basically what five pounds of muscle takes up. So there is no way that muscle will make you bulky unless you're doing some hormonal injections, right? Like there's no way that for women, women are not meant to be massive and bulky at all. Muscle takes up less space. And so when you think about protein, think about protein as your tool. It is your tool because it helps you stay full. It has a very low insulin response, right? And insulin is the key to keep low if you want to avoid gaining weight, right? If you want to avoid, um, you know, metabolic disease and, and obesity and fat gain around our waistline, especially. And it also has a very thermic effect. The thermic effect basically means is that you can, um, it actually increases your metabolic rate by 15 to 30%. That means you burn more calories by eating more protein. Um, and also protein feeds your muscle. Protein is a major main food for muscle growth. And so in order for us to build more muscle, um, and, and increase our metabolism, our metabolic rate by 15 to 30%, we need to make sure that we're increasing our protein and prioritizing that protein. And another reason we want to do this is when we look at, you know, the aging population, if you look at the aging population, they start to develop anabolic resistance. And as you age, your protein needs increase. And this anabolic resistance can be seen in, in starting from the age of 30 right? You can, if you start to increase resistance training and increase protein, you can combat this, right? But we need to understand that as women, we need to prioritize protein because it will make us live longer. We will be healthier long-term. You know, actually yesterday I was watching a um, a recap of America's Got Talent and they had this 74-year-old woman who looked phenomenal and you can tell that she was you know lifting weights she was you know focusing on bodybuilding and you can see her body was fantastic and you could not tell that she was 74 years old you see this picture that you see on the top right corner that is a good friend of mine she's in her 60s and she prioritizes protein over any other food right and there therefore you can see that she's going to live a very long and healthy life and not lose muscle as as she ages right versus if you look at the woman on the bottom um that's just a google image but you can see she's reliant on another person to live a healthy life she has she has a dependency and i'm sure all of us as we age we want to age gracefully we want to age um you know healthy we want to look great well into our 60s and 80s and so if you want to understand how much protein you need first we need to understand um how much protein we get in a day right if you compare most of us say we like oh i start my day off with two eggs in the morning and i say you know what that's great i'm so glad that you're starting off with protein in the morning eggs is a great source of protein but that's only about 10 to 12 grams of protein in your first meal and that's for the most of us it's not enough 
it's not enough protein. And so we need one to two grams per kilogram of our body weight. 0.8 grams is, is the bare minimum to sustain life, to sustain our basic metabolic functions. And so we have to really strive to make sure we're getting our minimum requirements. Otherwise, we're going to start to notice dysfunction in our metabolism or metabolic processes. And that we might not even notice now, but we may notice years and years later down the road. And so it's hard to get these protein requirements consistently with the modern diet and lifestyle. So this is why, you know, I really recommend, you know, if you can't get it through your diet and you have a very, you know, restrictive diet, like for example, myself, I'm a vegetarian. So I have very limited sources of protein that I can rely on. If I could do it with just my food, I would do it. But the problem is I live a very busy lifestyle. I don't have... Um, a lot of access to certain foods, especially when I'm out. Um, today's a perfect example. I had to have a protein shake with me as, as I was like out and about today. So I grabbed a protein shake, but this is why I like to use whey, right? Whey is the best form of protein to supplement with. It's high in leucine. Leucine is the trigger for muscle protein synthesis. It helps your body build muscle. It is the highest amino acids for human requirements. Um, basically, it's show, it, it has the highest um, number that you can give to a protein that shows that your body's able to absorb it and digest it. And when it comes to whey protein, here's what really matters, the quality. Okay, when it comes to protein, taste and smell are two big factors, two big giveaways that let you know whether or not a protein is a good source of protein. And so if you look at most proteins or most uh, proteins out there on the market, you know, you'll see a lot of whey isolate proteins and whey isolates themselves um, are very, are not, are not the best to supplement with as a meal. And the reason for that is because they digest very quickly in our bodies. We want to have, especially if we want to have a meal supplement, something to supplement with our foods, we want to have something that digests slowly and fast. So we get that amino acids right away, but at the same time, we need that long uh, lasting energy. We want that long lasting thermic effect from our proteins. And so we want to pick a meal replacement um, that has fast and slow digesting proteins versus an isolate. The problem with using an isolate is that if we aren't, aren't like, you know, intense bodybuilders or spending two to three hours at the gym, you know, we can be potentially peeing out whatever we don't use immediately. And it won't keep us full. We'll end up feeling hungry within, you know, half an hour to an hour or two later. And so that's why you want to look for a good meal replacement supplement. And I can definitely recommend you one if you're open to it. Um, if you are looking for something to help you get your protein intake and reach your protein goals, if you can't, if you feel like you're struggling with doing with your food alone. And so it all comes down to this, how you start your day will determine how you end your day. If you start your day with, you know, carbohydrates, right? Like, um, you know, like uh, bagels, muffins, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Like you are going to start to feel hungry within an hour right? Even oatmeal itself sometimes can make you feel hungry within an hour, depending on what you're putting in it, like honey and like, you know, dates and stuff like that. And most people do that a lot, um, or even more nuts. And so um, if you start your day with a high protein breakfast or high protein first meal, whatever you want to call it, you will start to notice that you don't feel as hungry throughout the day, right? Especially with in combination with the live fiber and the prebiotic fibers, you're not going to feel hungry because you're filling your body up with foods that give your body that nourishment and give your body that long sustaining energy. And so what we're doing with this cleanse is we're taking a very targeted approach to resetting and building the health of our microbiome versus a shotgun approach where you try a little bit of this and a little bit of that and you get absolutely nowhere, right? This is cleanse this whole process and this whole program is designed specifically to help our natural digestive process and enhance the microbial diversity that's been lost over the years, right? From many factors, including our diet, exposure to toxins, pharma drugs, you know, cleaning products and over the counter, counter medications, right? And so remember that this process is a long-term process. It can take, it may only take you 60 days and that's great, or it may take you up to six months. So just remember to use your chart, keep track of, you know, what you're taking every day. And just remember that consistency is key. 
It's not just what we do in 30 days, it's what we do long term that counts. That's what really, really matters. And so just remember that tomorrow is day 11. We are going to start to incorporate five capsules of Paraway Plus. So just remember to take your five caps tomorrow morning um, and keep on that one scoop of live fiber. And if you need to, you want to add in that aloe vera in the evening. Now, you may notice that by increasing that para weight plus, you might notice some additional cramping, and that's totally normal. That's just that bad bacteria trying to fight its way out, okay? So just understand that when that does happen, that's what's happening, okay? And so it's completely normal. Again, as we work together, I really want to emphasize that you do not need to be relying on willpower to build the habits to achieve your goals, right? You're here to get educated, right? With a combination of education, the right tools, you will be able to bridge the gaps in a simple and sustainable way to achieve a healthy microbiome. And I'm here to support you throughout that process. And so our next webinar was going to be on July 6th. This is day 21, which is when we're going to be starting to add those probiotics, those healthy probiotics, those diverse species of probiotics. And we're going to learn about why this is going to be so powerful for this process and how it's going to help us. And so, and we're also going to be talking about some fermented foods and what types of fermented foods will be helpful and aid this uh, cleansing process for us as well. And then finally on day 30, July 16th, um, at 8 p.m., we're going to be talking about results, experiences, and then learn about those next steps to maintain a healthy microbiome long term. So that's all for now. Um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and I look forward to checking back with each of you soon.